Hello and welcome back to Offering Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Rina Ramkumar. And joining me today is Nikolai Herman. Hello. And Alison Lewis. Hey, everyone. So we got a chance to talk to the Mental Health Collective and guess what it's time for. The Mental Health Week, right? The Mental Health Awareness oh, Week. Oh, Awareness Week. Okay, yeah, so it's time to be aware about mental health and it's time for an entire week of exciting offers from the Mental Health Collective as they have a whole series of interesting events which are focused at trying to understand the different mental scenarios that one can be in while during their early career research. Anyway, so we got the chance to talk to Julian D. Rolfs commonly called as J.D. Rolls or J.D., and uh, Barbara Safarich, who are a part of the Mental Health Collective, and they really had a lot of uh, interesting words to say to us. And uh, we're recording this after we did the interview with them, so we actually have a bit of uh, context. So, Nico, what did you think? Yeah, I mean, it was great that both of them, they, I think, were involved in starting this whole initiative because so far nothing else really existed in the Max Planck Society, which is a bit of a bummer, I think, uh, as one of the top institutions, again, in Germany. Um, I think it's uh, important to pay attention to these things, right? Yeah, definitely. And uh, Ali, what's your take on mental health? Because uh, unfortunately, you were not a part of the team when we were recording this episode, but uh, I would like to hear what you have to say about it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a hot topic right now in science is mental health. Everyone talks a lot about the pressure in, in science. And I know I know we had this last year at the Mental Health Awareness Week. And I think it was really important in bringing awareness to the issue. But one of the things I noticed on the schedule this week that I think is really important is actually how to recognize and support people who, in your life who might be living with mental illness. And so I think it's not just for people who are struggling with mental health themselves, but maybe for being aware of what's going on in your scientific community. Perfect, very well said. And interestingly, there's the Dresden site, that's where you are, right, Ali? Yeah, yeah, so our, our site's actually pretty active in it. So we, we did a lot of stuff last year. We had like little pizza circles last year where we kind of talked about, okay, imposter syndrome and day in the life of a scientist and, you know, just trying to really like normalize the feelings that, that we have. And, you know, you don't need to feel stress and anxiety all this time, you know, like experiments fail, that's normal things. Like, you know, you don't need to be perfect yeah. as a scientist all the time. So yeah, our site's pretty active. It's nice. Well, yeah, I completely agree with that. And I think with that, let's uh, get on with the discussion with JD and Barbara. And they have a lot to say about it. So I hope you guys stick till the end. And let's, let's talk about mental health now, shall we? Hey, JD and Barbara, thanks a lot for joining this episode of The Offspring Magazine, the podcast. How's it going? Good. Thank you for the invitation. It's nice to be here. Exactly. Thank you so much for the invitation. So with this episode of the podcast, we're really trying to understand how the concept of mental health is being dealt with by the Max Planck Society and by the people working at the Max Planck Society. And I think you guys have really been an, an integral part of the whole movement and the Mental Health Collective. That's a great job there. I think Nico has a few questions to ask you guys. Yeah, I mean, you guys have been more involved with mental health in general. So it would be great if you could just uh, give us a short introduction on your person. Uh, so uh, why you're interested in the topic and also what you're doing. Like, what, what are you actually doing in the Max Planck Society? Uh, so I'm a PhD student here at Max Planck of Biochemistry. And I've been... I cannot say I'm interested in mental health. I was, I crashed into mental health issues during my PhD. And when it happened around two years ago, there was absolutely nothing. And since then I'm trying to kind of play my part and hopefully improve conditions for any future crashing victims that they know what they can do and how to ask for help. And that they're definitely not alone. And it's not only them that this is happening to. 
I think I have nothing to add for how to get involved mm -hmm. with mental health. Um, it's kind of the same story for me, only I'm not here in Munich in the Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry. I'm coming from Mülheim, Max Planck Institute for Coal Research. And uh, when I needed a restart three years ago, two and a half years ago, um, I was lucky enough to have good, uh, good support by my supervisor but uh, found it very difficult to access something on a more structural level. So um, following this uh, ex experience myself, mm -hmm. you know, okay. kind of heard something started. I mean, thanks for sharing your personal experience on this. I mean, I think this is not an easy topic to talk to. So maybe as a starting point, let's maybe try to define what good mental health is first. So what would you guys uh, uh, say is like good mental health? How do you know you're in a good condition? Like, I mean, I feel like if you, I don't know, trip, you fall, you scrape your knee, you know, okay, I injured myself. But with mental health, it's not that easy. Um, yeah, I mean, that's true. It's not because we're not so used to it. Um, I think what we need to do as, as a society, but also as individuals, is to, to sensitize mm -hmm. about our own well-being. So um, what I would advise to do is to constantly check how do I feel. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, having this feedback loop kind of sensitizes me to to my own the sickness of my body also, and um, to thinking about my well-being. I mm -hmm. think that's the very very key part to to value my own well-being as something that is worth putting effort into. Okay, um, how would you say do you do this though? I mean, I, I because I mean it's not that you're always feeling super excited and happy about life, right? I mean, exactly. it's just always going up and down. That's normal. But uh, what would you say, do you, where do you recognize that it's like not going that well? Well, first, I think one of the big signs that you're kind of getting more stressed out or worked out or you're working out too much or mm -hmm. something's off is, for me personally, it was when I stopped sleeping well. Okay. So this is something that might sneak in into your everyday life and it can pass months before you notice what is happening. Mm -hmm. The same goes with like, you just forget to eat, you, you stop being hungry and you're not aware of this. So mm -hmm. it is really easy to be stuck in a hole and slowly keep drowning for really months before you realize something's wrong with mm -hmm. you. And this is exactly what JD mentioned, you really need to pay a close attention to yourself. And it sounds super simple, but actually, mm -hmm. if uh, before all of this happened to me, I was really not paying any attention to mm -hmm. how actually I am feeling because no one ever taught me to do this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I have a job, like I'm, I'm healthy, luckily, I'm fine. Like, why would I not be fine? Mm -hmm. So it, I really crashed and burned bef before I realized that I need to ask for help and that whatever is happening is not okay. Okay, so basically uh, what you're saying is that it's like something that uh, takes quite a while to happen and often then when you realize it, it's already too late. So... Unfortunately, yes. I, I so think, basically, uh, sorry, yeah. I think that's the point what we are trying to do here, just mm -hmm. to raise awareness because if people are talking about it all the mm -hmm. time and maybe it will get stuck somewhere in your head, mm -hmm. this couple of trigger signs that you might mm -hmm. pay attention to and then just stop and okay think for a day or two like am i doing well like mm -hmm. what can i do how can i change my life to improve my well-being okay so what kind of uh, thoughts do you try to uh, ask yourself uh, during Thanks. this process because i feel like this is the, what you what people should know yeah that's a i think a really really nice question so one one picture that helps me a lot is thinking of a water line so like okay. thinking of an ocean myself mm -hmm. swimming in an ocean Am I staying above or below the waterline? That's the question I ask myself. So I try to be, it's fine to dive every now and then, mm -hmm. but it's important to, to overall be, be mm -hmm. above the waterline. As a scientist, I have a scale for this, of course. Like I ask myself a lot and also other people around mm -hmm. me, how do you feel on a scale from one to 10? Mm -hmm. And normally I have a threshold at five and a threshold below three. So if people say like generally below five, it's like really, mm -hmm. really, uh, alarming and also if they if they say often below three so like the the, the deep lows mm -hmm. get below three like two or one mm -hmm. um that's like alarm signs i think okay 
these are kind of my personal thresholds if I have to, you know, put okay. a scale on it. But in general, this picture of, of a waterline, mm -hmm. asking myself, am, am, am I above or mm -hmm. below the waterline? Okay, so you have more this mental image of swimming and seeing if you're actually drowning to some extent. Exactly, yeah. Okay. yeah. No, but this scale that you develop for yourself is highly subjective, right? Yes. So, certainly. And it's, it's a very personal thing that people have to be able to, you know, Totally. find the courage to develop it themselves that they have this this is their water level because what my water level may be may be different for someone else yeah absolutely and absolutely this is very very subjective mm -hmm. yeah. do you keep how do you keep track of it do you like i don't know just uh, talk to people about this regularly and somewhat remember or do you try to write it down to some extent because then i mean it would be easier to track your trends right i mean i'm not really like in a diary style uh, way I think I, I don't have to like really track it. Mm -hmm. I don't really have to make a mean or a okay. medium, you know. Yeah. I don't have to analyze the data. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's also a nice practice to, to just add this question on a mm -hmm. scale from 1 to 10. How are you doing okay. in, a, in a normal context conversations mm -hmm. with my friends? I mean, I ask them, how are you anyway? Mm -hmm. But we're in a, I mean, we grow up in a society where it's common to just say, yeah, good, you. Yeah. So... Like I cannot rely on this answer, so that's why why I apply this scale because mm -hmm. then you know the people think about it okay, for so, a second. So you actually ask them about the scale and what number they, mm -hmm. they get that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and okay. ask myself and people in conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how easy is it for you guys to talk to other people about this? Because I mean, it is a more personal issue, and I feel like um, maybe because all the PhD students are not supposed to be affected by mental health because they're supposed to work hard and this by default so it might not come up that often so do you guys talk in your uh, groups uh, regularly about these things that's a very good point Nicole. oh yeah i mean definitely more these days and i think in the last especially in the last year that's my impression the mental health within max Planck society became a big topic mm -hmm. among my friends maybe that's just because i'm personally invested so much in it i notice it now more mm -hmm. but i have a feeling that it's like everywhere especially for young people mm -hmm. i mean phds i mean all the research shows that we are really exposed to horrible conditions of working under stress and that everybody feels yes. it right i mean yes. no, no, no. yeah you feel it yeah Okay, so generally uh, talking about mental health is not an easy uh, thing to do with uh, colleagues um, because, I mean, usually you're under a lot of pressure and you need to perform, I feel, as a PhD student. So how is this handled in uh, your uh, departments or groups? I mean, that's a, that's a personal question because everybody has an individual approach. And I think, well, for, for me it was not really a question how to do it because when I was shattering, I was kind of like needing to inform mm -hmm. my boss also. But all the all the really good feedback I got mm -hmm. from my colleagues and also boss um, was yeah it was was really helping to to step out. And I the, the, the interesting thing is that I never made a single bad experience with talking about it. Like there's never been a single person who said really okay. like something so everybody takes it quite serious, um, and that's that's a very very good experience to make yes. because Definitely. it shows me that that it's there's room for that. Mm -hmm. so. no, that that's great. It and was the same in my case. I mean, I was really bad, and there was I realized there's no point in hiding it because that will not help me. Mm -hmm. So at some point, I really started basically screaming. Mm -hmm. And everyone in my group knew that I'm not doing well. I mean, I talked with everyone. I was talking with my boss and I just told him, like, this is happening. Mm -hmm. I don't know when I'll feel better. I'm just currently not able to work. And mm -hmm. my boss really didn't put any pressure on me whatsoever. He asked what he can do if he needs to change a project. He told me that I don't have to worry about work whatsoever, that I can mm -hmm. take as much time as I need. Okay. Because I was also going on a therapy in the middle of the day. I mean, finding a therapist in some kind of normal mm -hmm. working hours is pretty hard. So I was, like, going to therapy at 11 or at 3. So I was, like, in and out of the lab a lot. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, my boss was real supportive with this, and in my entire group, I also didn't have mm -hmm. any kind of negative experience whatsoever. Okay, so I feel like this, you guys had very positive experiences with, uh, with this issue. Um, but what would you, for example, recommend to a person that might not be sure that the, uh, their boss or their peers might react in that way? 
would you say that they should maybe try to, I don't know, like, what, how should they deal with it? <laughs> well, to be honest, mm -hmm. I think if you cannot share this with your friends, get new friends. And if, if you cannot share this with your boss, get a new boss. Mm -hmm. Because I think, especially in academia, um, so much is relying on, on my own dedication, on my own creativity. And if my boss is happy with generating a work environment where this is just completely not there because he puts, they put pressure on me, um, even when I'm, I'm mm -hmm. asking for help, you mm -hmm. know, I think that's the very wrong approach. And mm -hmm. I, um, I can fortunately say I have experience with two directors because during my um, crash, I was switching research groups from a um, synthetic organic lab to a computational chemistry now. So completely into the theory, um, and both directors were 100% supportive mm -hmm. and just giving me all the opportunities that I needed and mm -hmm. no pressure at all. And just mm -hmm. said, you are both independently from, from each other. We're saying you are the boss of your own therapy. If you need anything from, from mm -hmm. me, let me know. And otherwise, I'll just leave you alone. So would you guys say that generally the directors seem to be open for this topic, um, but it's hard to talk to them because they, they are still the, the boss or your boss, I guess, in this case. Also, also an individual, like mm -hmm. it depends on the individual situation. Um, I can definitely, like, that resonates. It resonates strongly. Uh, my experience is positive, purely mm -hmm. positive with talking to my boss. But still, I really, like, of course, I remember this, this mm -hmm. big step it was for me to mm -hmm. actually having a breakdown in his room. Like, okay. I was, there was the, the moment where, mm -hmm. where I just let go when mm -hmm. I was starting, mm -hmm. starting to cry in the, in the office of my mm -hmm. uh, director. And... Um, That, I mean, uh, yeah, then there's no way back, kind of, right? Yes. But it, as I said, it was a huge relief. It was okay. just positive. I mean, it just shows, I think, again, how stressful like the, the PhDs, yeah. I guess, can be. So you would also say that PhDs in general or people that follow the academic career are like more susceptible to this the kind of, uh, to have like mental health issues, I guess. I think we are, and I think that's mostly because we are also passionate and we really identify with what we are doing, which is, at least for me, this was the big problem that I really identified with my project and my experiments were failing, which in my head meant that I'm failing and that I'm a failure. Mm -hmm. And then it's like ball that keeps on rolling right down yes. the hill and gets bigger and bigger and you cannot stop it at some point. So I think this is one of the main reasons why PhD as a group of younger people might be more suspect. I mean, it could, Of course, we work a lot, but I think it has a lot to do with idea in our head and what mm -hmm. standards we have for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Very much. Okay. Which are really not healthy when you compare yourself with someone who has mm -hmm. a normal nine to five job and they will not cry if experiments <laughs> fail, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, the numbers show it. The yeah. numbers do certainly show that, okay. uh, that PhDs, mm -hmm. um, in general, academics are at higher risk. Okay. And I mean, It totally makes sense, right? There's a lot of ambition. There's a lot of self-pressure. We talked about this yesterday also. This is going in loops because basically what I'm, what is putting pressure on me is my view of the expectation of somebody else on me, mm -hmm. right? So this goes like a little bit of ping pong before it actually, mm -hmm. actually might get it. But we must not forget that, I mean, especially as the PhDs now here in the Max Planck Society, I mean, we're, we're, Kind of, we have this concept of gold standards in computational chemistry. You know, there's, I mean, there is of course always something, something that goes above, but there's, there's kind of a threshold where you say this is, this is pretty much as, mm -hmm. as good as it gets. And we must not forget that when we compare ourselves in the lab with others, we like, there's nothing really above this threshold. Mm -hmm. So this is not a threshold that is, that is healthy in any way to, to compare to, right? Okay. So this. This is, I think, a very important thing to understand that, that mm -hmm. we're in, a, in an environment that is, that is pretty much... In, in German uh, academia, I would say there's nothing comparable. There's nothing mm -hmm. as, mm -hmm. as big as the Max Planck Society, right? So we're, um, 
there's yeah also the fact that we solely focus on our research and don't have to deal with students makes us feel so small because we're the smallest fish in our aquarium mm -hmm. right yes definitely. and this is certainly different when you work at a, at a university mm -hmm. so these are all factors there's small tiny factors but they add up right this mm -hmm. is the whole concept we have to consider mm -hmm. so i yeah i mean the numbers tell a good story and i can certainly see why okay Maybe uh, one last question to the mental health topic. Um, if you realize that someone in your lab uh, might, I mean, first of all, how do you realize that someone in your lab might be going down the drain? And, and, the, and on the other hand, how would you then approach them on this? Because even if you see someone that might have experienced something that like you did before, but you, and you want to help them, how do you do this without, I don't know, if you, for example, didn't talk too much before a person is new, joined for a year, is then realizing things don't go the way you want them to, and then how do you help? How can one approach this? Or should I mean, you should, I would say, but it's, it's how, not easy, right? right? The question is how, yeah. That's a very good question, and I actually think it's easier for an outsider to spot that something's happening with you. At least that was in my case and in people around me as well, like when I was thinking backwards, like months and months before I realized that I'm going down, there were like people like my friends giving me subtle hints that I'm behaving a bit different mm -hmm. or that I'm doing something that's not mm -hmm. what I used to do or, you know, it's really a small things. And I think that's the problem. It's a lot of small things that you yourself might not pick up on. So if you have a colleague in the lab and you see that it's, that that person is more stressed out or is just more quiet or starts coming in very late mm -hmm. because if you cannot sleep you can also not get up in the morning um, if you notice that someone didn't wash their hair in two weeks you might want to check up on them and seriously just take them by the hand sit them down and just be there and listen like offer your ear i think that's the best you can do like because we were, I think we were all scared of being judged. And as soon as you give someone opportunity to feel safe and mm -hmm. kind of just open up, I think this is a very important thing you can do as maybe not even a friend, just like a colleague, like someone you spent a certain amount of time at the same place. No, no, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, I, I don't know. I myself see the Max Planck Society a bit like a big family mm. that you and then helping each other out, I think, make, makes a lot of sense. A follow up to uh, the previous question. So you were talking about some obvious things, like let's say like a phenotype or something that people show when they get depressed. And so, so there are some people with, for whom it's very obvious, but then there are also some people for whom it's not really uh, you know, so the, the, they they normally seem this way, and they also seem this way, like seem the same outwardly because they're trying to control so many aspects of it, and that's causing additional uh, problems as well, right? So, so I mean, there are subtle cases of this where we can't really detect it from an outsider's perspective, and even the person from inside is trying to resist these uh, sort of feelings. So how do you approach a person like that? And you, you you don't know if this person is right or not. And you don't, I mean, they don't want to be there, right? So, I mean, it's, it's a tough position. Do you guys have a take on this? You you cannot, you, I mean, it's, it's not like our job to save the world, right? It's not our job to tell anybody, hey, you have severe problems, go see somebody. Um, I think, I think the way forward is compassion is kindness is is like barbara just said offering an ear and showing that there's no judgment but some some you know humanity and i think that is that is the that is the only thing i would i would uh, recommend in this this way how to approach people just be kind and be open and be full of compassion and love and then that's i think the best we can do I think what Barbara mentioned being this like safe space that you can give someone. I mean, it's not like you're also under a lot of stress, right? So it's not that you, as you mentioned, have to help everyone where you think there might be some issue, but just if you see someone just take one hour, maybe one once a month or even 
like just at some point and then help them out a bit because I think one hour <laughs> everyone should be able to have that much time. You wouldn't believe how much small things mean like just someone stopping by and asking you hey how are you today i mean that's all it takes you don't yeah exactly it's like really small things that sometimes made my day and made me get up next day from the bed Mm -hmm. so like it doesn't have to be i mean you don't need to change anyone's life and one thing that people often forget you cannot help anyone who doesn't want to help themselves and this is something, I mean, if you have a person in front of you who is just falling apart and you tried and you tried and nothing's working, it's easy to start blaming yourself. But at the end of the day, everyone has responsibility towards themselves to take care of themselves, right? So you cannot force anyone to seek help. You cannot force anyone to go to a therapy. There's So it's mm-hmm. it, there has to be this awareness. It's, there's only so much you can do because it's easy then to again cross this line and then cause more harm to yourself mm-hmm. than you're actually helping the other person. Yeah. Also, you should like people should be okay with being not okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think this is the whole point of raising awareness. Just exactly. Like no one expects you to be super happy all day. I mean, it's okay if you have a day off and nothing's mm-hmm. going well. It's just take it easy on yourself. Mm-hmm. You don't have to punish yourself for experiments gone wrong. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Still, for me, the major effort, the, the most time I put in, a, like the most time of the day I put in making sure that I'm okay, that I'm good, that I'm happy. Like this is still after like three years of, of going back up, two and a half. Uh, it's still like my main focus and what I spend most time on to just make sure that I'm good. You know, take my time in the morning, just do it. You know, there's n- nobody like judging me if I if I take another hour to just get out of bed, but eventually being able to get out of bed and start into the day. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think these are these are the things um, mm-hmm. that, that are important to find the triggers that how to how to improve the, the own. I mean, now we already touched on this topic a bit, so I just wanted to ask you more directly: Is mental health uh, being taken seriously in the Max Planck society? Because I think this is a, a big thing to see whether if, uh, they actually want to help us with this or if they just leave us to ourselves. I would say yes and no and yes. I think I have three. There are, there are multiple layers to this question, right? So in general, um, there's a lot of awareness and a lot, lot of understanding in Max Planck society. Um, we, we are kind of running into open doors when it comes to the ideal. Mm-hmm. Um, also, as I said, my individual experience on, on the local level are just purely positive. Mm-hmm. There's, there's space for this. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, us PhDs starting the initiative of the first Mental Health Awareness Week in the Max Planck Society in 2019, then approaching the um, occupational health management with the idea of a Mental Health Awareness Week 2020 and getting the response we don't have resources for that in the middle of a pandemic, is maybe not what I would like to have in such an organization. So there's, yeah, as I said, yes and no and yes. There are levels where this is really taken seriously. And there are levels where, where a little more support structure that us PhDs are now, with PhDs and postdocs, are now um, building the mental health collective from within because there is nothing that is willing to take over this from top down. Um, is, is, I think, showing that there's a lack also, mm-hmm. certainly. You know, that's actually uh, um, pretty revealing. I didn't expect that to be the case, I have to admit. Um, do you want to maybe go into a bit more detail about the initiative you guys uh, started? Um, and what's the plan for it in the longer run? What's the immediate plan and what's the plan in the long run? So we, <laughs> we want to know both. So in 2019, as JD just said, PhDNet organized first ever Mental Health Awareness Week within Max Planck Society. And I think this was very well received. The feedback that we got was amazing. 
and just kind of building up on that this beginning of this year, even before Corona happened, uh, there was idea that we should start like a group or something more concrete that is not just awareness week, which is five days, mm -hmm. one week in per year, right? And this is how Mental Health Collective was born. So it's three PhDs and one postdoc. At the moment, we started it. Now more and more people are joining, which is really nice to see. But at the beginning, it was just us, the survivors of Mental Health Awareness Week from 2019. Yeah, I think the plans are hard to grasp. I mean, we started uh, the, the tea time now, which is received really nicely. It's also so much fun to, to organize this and like it's so mm -hmm. different every time. Okay. So coming in the tea time, we have no clue what's going to happen. Can you just quickly explain what this tea time is about? And... Uh, so tea time happens once every two weeks. At the moment, it's happening on Thursdays at 3 p.m. And basically, it's a virtual coffee slash tea break mm -hmm. where we talk about mental health. So you can join over Zoom. You can join anonymously. You can just be there and listen. Mm -hmm. Some people engage, some people don't feel comfortable, of course, mm -hmm. joining a bunch of strangers and talking about their personal problems. But that's why we are there to share our stories, to kind of show people that sharing is caring and you really help other people by sharing your stories. And all the knowledge that we accumulated from how to navigate German healthcare system, insurance companies, getting a therapist, or even how EMAP works within Max Planck Society. Mm -hmm. A lot of people still don't know that we have EMAP or that mm -hmm. you can get a therapist in Germany that also speaks a bunch of other languages and that your therapy is covered mostly by health insurance. Okay. So what, can you maybe also explain EMAP, what exactly that is, just to go into like a bit of more detail, what things yeah. exist within the society? Employees and management assistance program, I think is what, what it's okay. standing for. That's the acronym. It, of course, is not revealing anything, right? It, no. Not really. So basically, as far as I understand it, um, it's a service by the Fürstenberg Institute, mm -hmm. which is an independent um, service provider. And what they do provide is 24-7, I think, even hotline where you can call whenever you have a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, um, as they have an overall contract with the Max Planck Society, every um, every employee of the Max Planck Society can call there and get their service completely for free by just saying, I'm part of the Max Planck Society. So you get an immediate help on the phone and um, from there on you can get started. Um, it even goes so far that they make um, emergency appointments with somebody local in your area, also try to, can try to find some, some spots in regular therapy. Um, and yeah, just be there for questions and uh, help. Um, that's, I would say, that's okay. how I would. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, this can all be done anonymously. So whoever is worried about name calling or privacy issues, EMAP works also anonymously. So you don't have to be scared that your boss will get an email that you mm -hmm. have a breakdown or something. So. Mm -hmm. People, please call if you need help. Okay. Yes, we will link all of the information in the podcast um, yes. notes so you can find them uh, definitely online. Cool. Okay. Right. And another thing maybe that uh, I found in my institute was like a therapist that we have, I think. So is this also more of a common thing across? You don't have it anymore. Oh, we don't have it anymore. <laughs> so since, <Okay. laughs> since EMAP started, as far as I know, since EMAP started, the Max Planck mm -hmm. Society pulled the local therapists. Ah, okay, good to know. So the one we had here, she was not really good with English. And she was my first person I went to because it was mm -hmm. like, it's handy, it's right here, right? You're all day in the lab. I had no idea who to ask for help. I was like, oh, okay, we have a therapist at the Institute Okay, that's my place to go. And I went there and her English was not really so good. And after talking with her for like 10 minutes, she told me that, that she cannot help me, that I need a psychiatrist. And I was like, whoa. That is, uh... Thank you, <laughs> you know? Like yes. I made this massive first step to ask for help and like, bam. <laughs> like, oh. okay. 
<laughs> so would you say that generally being an international student it makes it even harder to get help now? I mean, I'm not sure with this EMAP, maybe it's getting easier, but it seems like it's even a bigger hurdle. I think with being international, the problem is you don't know the system, you don't know the health system, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're like, if you have no real serious health issues, you go to the doctor to get antibiotics every once in a while, right? I think mm -hmm. that's most how people deal with doctors. So as an international, I had no, I mean, I had no idea. I was like, oh my God, how will I pay this? I had no idea that health insurance can cover this. Like mm -hmm. I didn't even know how to start looking for a therapist. Mm -hmm. And now with EMA, def definitely I think it's easier with EMA because you can call them, you can talk in English and they can help you out. Mm -hmm. But before that, there was nowhere you could, you could even okay. call, right? So mm -hmm. you were totally left on your own. Okay. And EMAP is started, started this year, last year? Uh, last year-ish, okay. yeah. Okay. So it's it's very, fairly new. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it will stay there. Mm -hmm. But this is also kind of point of collective that we are trying to help people mm -hmm. get an idea how they can help themselves. Yes. And which resources you have. And there's a lot of resources out there. You just need to know where to look. Mm -hmm. which is a problem if you don't speak English but German. I have a question in this direction. So you have, so people are, so the hope is that people are going to EMAP when they need help, right? So do we have any uh, sort of statistics in this direction to at least see if people are, I mean, is, it's, is this something being used or is it just something that, you know, we know is there, but we have no clue if people are using I mean, it. Or not. I'm afraid that maybe because it's still so new, it's hard to have statistics already. I would assume that maybe next year or something like that, something might come out. So because they have to get paid somehow, right? So they have like some kind of contract, I would assume. I would need to call Martin Stratmann for that, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. I don't have the data on my laptop at the moment. No, I think, I mean, that's the thing, right? We're what should we say? We're a bottom-up approach. We're just here trying to help people survive. <laughs> um, so we are, we are not the ones organizing the, the, the mm -hmm. EMAP, so we, we have no fucking clue about mm -hmm. No, I just meant the reason I'm asking is because we sort of feel that international students perhaps may take this, may have a bigger advantage with EMAP because they can speak in their language. So perhaps we have, and also the Max Planck is fairly international throughout Germany. We have so many people from different countries, right? So perhaps there is an increase. It's just that, you know, like they say, just bring a random analogy here. Let's say with COVID, when people say we're testing more, that's why we have more cases. It's because there are the cases are undetected, right? It's not because the testing is increased. It's because the cases are undetected. And this is my, so my expectation is that we have more people using it now because they can access it, yeah. Which would be a nice thing, right? Because, I mean, yes. the problems are there anyway. And if, like, people start using resources, that's exactly what these, res what these resources yes. are for. I mean, I assume it's probably not so cheap to get this contract with them, so using it is definitely a good thing. Yeah. And if it helps international students more, I think just leaving these issues to themselves is not a good idea anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, but, uh, let's hope that it's being used. Yeah. I mean, maybe getting back to the thing that you were starting from bottom up. So uh, what uh, do you want to do from now on? Do you guys have plans already? Because I mean, it seems like it's kind of difficult, first of all, because you, you're only in quotation marks a PhD student, but then getting connected to the whole Max Planck Society with 81 or more in institutes, it's like a tough thing to do. Then the nice thing is that we have nice allies, right? We have the PhD net and the postdoc mm -hmm. net as allies in the occupational health management, also in the headquarters mm -hmm. where we are in close contact to. So um, immediate things we are working on at the moment are, of course, the Mental Health Awareness Week 2020. Mm -hmm. We are also um, participating in the next alumni mm -hmm. symposium as, a, as the collective. And there are also other endeavors um, in this regard, just to reach out. Um, also this year, right? I mean, this is exactly what, what we're trying to get, some exposure, mm -hmm. some, some, some platform to talk about this mm -hmm. and to talk about the idea of the collective as a mm -hmm. point to, to start, mm -hmm. kind of. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, given the fact that we're quite, like, still quite young and uh, mm -hmm. quite fairly small, that is, I think, the, the biggest um, 
okay. and they're at the moment to try mm -hmm. to reach out and mm -hmm. finding ears and finding allies. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, the sky's the limit. We are, we've been thinking about um, mm -hmm. workshops and retreats and things. So, mm -hmm. I mean, this kind of also depends on the resources, of course, that are eventually going to be available. Um, but there are plans also to... Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, immediate goals we're working on right now and their dreams and ideals we kind of so uh, how could we follow you guys or see what you guys are doing like is there a way to uh, find you online like reach out or, to you yes in case people want to get in touch with you plenty plenty yes so we have a mailing list you can sign up and we are pretty active on twitter and you can always join our tea time Okay, What's your so account on Twitter? We can li link their Twitter oh, yeah, in the like show notes this. below. And also mailing list. So sure. mailing list is anonymous and we use it basically for just sending out information, also like reminders about the tea time, about upcoming projects, mm -hmm. and just like exchange of information, whatever is happening around mm -hmm. regarding mental health. Mm -hmm. Mm, you also mentioned it already, like what, how is uh, mental health uh, seen in Germany? So you already mentioned that uh, the insurance actually pays for stuff. So could you maybe elaborate on that? What exactly do they pay for? And is, are there only certain uh, therapists that you can go to or so on? Uh, yes, exactly. So some therapists are covering patients with public health insurance. Others are only for privately mm -hmm. insured people. So I have a standard AOCA public health insurance, and this enables me to get up to 300 hours of paid therapy without too many asked questions. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it goes with hospitalizations and some more severe forms mm -hmm. of therapy. Mm -hmm. Severe is a wrong word, like more serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it depends. I mean, this also depends on the, on the exact insurance program you have. Um, but in general, I would say Germany is a country that covers a lot, like, mm -hmm. especially for like when it comes to emergencies and you really go to, mm -hmm. to a hospital. That's all, always like in Germany, it's an option to call the ambulance for mental health issues. That's an oh, option. Okay. They, will, they will eventually help you. Um, and this is, I think, kind of a good picture. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, depicting well the situation, mm -hmm. that this is also possible here. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. so insurance-wise, it's, I think, most of like the, okay. what, what is needed mm -hmm. is covered. There's, of course, plenty of uh, therapies, alternative therapies, mm -hmm. approaches that are not covered, but this is, um, yeah, if you just go to the hospital and say, people, I need help, I'm suicidal, mm -hmm. then you probably have to maybe pay 10 euros for, you know, Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you don't abuse it, kind mm -hmm. of, but um, yeah, you okay. get the help for your insurance. Oh, no, I didn't know that you can actually call the ambulance because... Uh, I mean, s suicidal thoughts mm -hmm. are definitely a huge emergency. Okay. Please call ambulance. Yes, it's like always, or always. Or suicidal hotline or anyone, just mm -hmm. call someone. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that's de definitely an emergency that's worth... Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, and what? How do you think uh, does the German society see mental health? Like <laughs> getting to the bigger picture, because generally I feel like it's still seen as not uh, the same issue. I mean, if you, for example, uh, I don't know, chop some wood and chop off your arm, it's like a it's visible. Thing. Then, yes, right? exactly. You can see, yeah, okay, arm is missing. <laughs> I am definitely injured. But then with mental health, you just don't see it. Mm -hmm. And if someone has a burnout, like, it, it, do you think it's being seen? Or, the same way as chopping off your arm. I, I think that depends on like the social structure you, mm -hmm. you're inside, right? I mean, also Germany is very diverse when it comes to, to the social bubbles. Um, so they are certainly, like my experience, my own experience is very good. Mm -hmm. Also because I just select, you know, if mm -hmm. somebody is just not understanding of this, then there's no space for them in my life. End of story. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, there are, there are also people who have not so much understanding. Um, I think I personally think it's an advantage that you can't see it from the first moment. Mm -hmm. uh, this this injury, the scars mm -hmm. that they are mm -hmm. kind of invisible, because this gives me the chance to 
choose myself who mm -hmm. I open up to. Okay. You know, if I if I'm missing a limb, everybody will judge me firsthand by yes. being disabled. Exactly. Like, yes. Let's be let's be honest. So I think it it's an advantage in this case that it gives me the, the possibility to to choose. Okay. Okay. Now, so I mean, I just feel like generally it's only coming nowadays that uh, it's being taken more seriously. Yeah. Also, with the EMAP and all of these things coming, like last year, it's 2019. Come on, these things have been like people have done research on these kinds of things uh, for quite a while. So I mean, I'm glad it's happening, but I still feel we're not doing enough for this. It's, Definitely, the direction is the right way, but yeah. we're of course still. Just at mm. the start, I think patience is a very important virtue here. To just be like, to remind ourselves that we're on the right track, mm -hmm. that we're not, in this regard, not mm -hmm. going in the wrong direction as a society, um, and the rest just takes time, like mm -hmm. always. Yeah. Just uh, as a side note, I have this uh, wacky question: Do do anyone does anyone have an idea why it's taken so long, or what's been like the biggest barrier that we've had to cross? to reach this level of awareness now? Oof. Shame. I feel like there's so many uh, facets to it that it's hard to pinpoint yeah. it down to, okay, this is the no, issue that is keeping... No, it, it can be many uh, things, I'm just asking better. broadly. Yeah, no, I, I feel like also, I mean, generally the work environment has changed, right? I mean, for us, we're in a very selective uh, type of work, right? I mean, I don't know how, what the percentage is for research is, but it's super low. And also the type of work we're doing is quite different from the, like, average work, I would say, being more um, creative and so on. And this puts more strain on the mind, right? So generally this changing uh, type of work is, I think, also one of the bigger things that leads to more strain on the, on the mind, right? So now we need to realize how to help the mind if mm. it's like uh, overstrained. Yeah, I, I think this is actually a political question because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm directly thinking of of uh, capitalism, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, but I mean that's a that's a very very fair, very right direction. I think that we we are kind of getting awareness that behind every mind, behind behind every working um, person, like every every individual that is having a certain role, there's always always a human being, a soul behind it, and that we are all in some way or the other traumatized and the, that we all have our packages to, to carry and um, that we are all struggling in one way or the other um, and just opening the space for talking about this is, I think, I think that's the big advantage we, we like the big step we made in the last years that this is now recognized that you are not a not a um, loser if you open up about the struggles you have. You know that yes. this is kind of like this is removed. I am glad that the, the generational change is also bringing this with it because I feel if you talk to older people, like uh, they they're not so aware of this thing like like burnout is like okay what well, they're like okay they want to take a break for a couple months and then they're back, right? I mean, that's, that's how it works. And yeah, I mean, I think yeah. that that's a good point, generational, generational yeah. change. I mean, we are living in a different universe than our parents grew yeah, up, Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So true. with this, we did get a lot of privilege, but I think this privilege has its price. Mm -hmm. And one of the prices we are paying is definitely that our mental health is suffering because of everything we're exposed to constantly. We're so disconnected also. Yes. Yeah, I think we are way more disconnected than our parents were. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I think there's like studies on this generally that also people are getting more lonely and these kinds of things. And I feel like it's going to be even in, or increasing in the next couple of years. Like, I mean, we're like still in the center, I would say. So I was born before the internet was somewhat a thing. And now it's like, it's all over the place, right? I mean, yeah. it's, if you're not connected to the internet, you're like, like you don't see the whole world, so we also have the same same discussion that we're we're basically the generation now that knows the time before the digital singularity, but is still so young that we still mm -hmm. feel like digital natives. You know, we naturally grew into it. Mm -hmm. So, like we're 
that's that's a very important thing I think to understand that our generation mm -hmm. is is covering a singularity event, the merge, the rise of a new universe, mm -hmm. right? And this is something that never happened before in in the whole whole history of humanity. Mm -hmm. So there's no protocol. <laughs> like yes. nobody nobody has a clue what's happening. Nobody has a clue what's the direction to go, yes. and especially us as as being part of like the tip of the iceberg of the of the scientific knowledge kind of you know expanding the the overall human knowledge so having kind of an overview of of where we're actually standing it's not surprising that we see this the shit show that's happening and just looking for somebody with an idea and seeing there's nobody with an idea and then what the fuck so yeah i mean also it's a thing that you know so people from the 60s 70s 80s who were basically you know like our age during the growth of the internet so for them they feel we're being you know liberal snowflakes or you know all these million woke millennials let's say because these are terminologies that are usually used in a if, if you look at conservative news it, these are t terminologies which are used loosely and freely whereas it's not it's it is not that it's it's something deeper there is a deeper meaning to all of this and you know the, the way to take this forward or you know to convey that this is the message that we're trying to uh say can get lost completely in the whole array of uh, conflicting information from all around the world yeah and i mean also it's it's not that people that are young they don't have a voice really like who gathers all the opinions of all the 14 year olds now about what kind of issues they have in school and the internet no one does really i mean the researchers do, but then they have the study that gets published and then that's it, <laughs> right? Oftentimes it doesn't get get picked up by politics or anything like this. And because they're missing their voice, it's hard to see what, uh, what, what they're struggling with. And just getting this maybe out, uh, it would be like, or getting their um, opinions would be interesting already or important. I think it's, a, it's a, I mean, we already talked about this connection. I really mm -hmm. think it's a connection issue or a disconnection issue that mm -hmm. we're not only disconnected from ourselves, but also from the other individuals around us. We have our peers and we're kind of like connected to the closest people around us. But as you said, just, just a half generation away, we have not a single idea how their, how their life is, right? Yes. Either way. And I think that's an important thing to understand because of course, Somebody who is now, I don't know, 40, 50 years old has no idea mm -hmm. of how it feels to be end of 20 or 30 now. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this is important to understand for them as well. That Of course, they can call us snowflakes or mm -hmm. whatever they want, but they have no fucking clue about what's, mm -hmm. what's happening in our universe, right? Yes. How, how life is, as we don't have an idea how their life is, right? Exactly, yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, funnily, this judgment always just happens down yeah, I mean, the, the age. They are in the power, uh, <laughs> the powerful positions, yeah. right? I mean, they they are in the media positions. They decide what's happening in the world now. So, <laughs> yeah, twenty years maybe our generation will be in this, and then let's exactly. see. Exactly. So this it's 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 a requirement for a huge political shift, yeah. not just a shift. But at the moment, the... we are going in the wrong direction. Depends on where you look, I yeah. think. I think it it's, depends on where you look. It's, but it's, but uh, you brought up a good so point, things. like not having a voice. I mean, I think PhDs are guilty of the exactly same thing. I mean, I don't think I'm the only one that knows horror stories about people being abused at work or putting up with ridiculously working conditions and just not saying anything. And I think this is something that is now slowly kind of awakening also within the PhD people that you are realizing, okay, wait, I do have a saying in this, like, mm -hmm. I should stand up for myself, I can stand up for myself, and it's not like you're going to get fired, mm -hmm. and even if so, you need to stand up, stand up for yourself. And I think this is also how we are starting with collective from bottom up, like we are here, we are standing up. I mean, I definitely think that it's just, uh, I mean, you can ruin your whole life if you're like really uh, having mental issues and not taking them seriously. And then within five years, you're like uh, mentally dead. And that's why- Maybe I mean, not I mean, just I mean, mentally. Maybe. Maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe even physically, yes. And uh, like de-escalating this is very important. Yeah. 
And I think also what one thing that we have to consider though is that we in the Max Planck Society are in a more privileged position, right? Because we have the PhD net that is connecting like all the PhD students. Because if you're just one PhD student in uh, one institute, you don't know how it is for all the others. And then some institutes might not even have like some um, things that connect the PhD students from that institute. Now with Corona especially, it's hard to meet other people. And through Zoom, it's not the same than just True. sitting together, talking. It's drinking. not a hug, Every, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah, it's, totally. It's, but but important point, like big shout out to PhDNet at this at this point. Yes. Like how much I learned just through the through the discussions at the general meeting mm -hmm. about like working conditions at other other institutes to just get a relation mm -hmm. to just just get a point of, of comparison, kind of that like the, the I think the universe of PhDNet that it was generated is doing a tremendous job for, for all of us. Yes. Also to understand concepts such as power abuse in academia and all of these things because it's it's significant. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, talking to Paula Stefan uh, in our one of our podcast episodes, she was talking how uh, for postdocs it's even worse, right? I mean, yes. they're in the worst position. They have even less time to spend on uh, other activities to bring awareness uh, to these issues and they need to deliver even more than PhD students. So in the US, apparently, it's even like the um, abuse of postdocs for their labor, it's, it's even worse, so. And visas, right? <laughs> and visas now as well, <laughs> yeah. I think overarchingly, there's a theme that is here, you know, you can, you can realize there's a general theme that a lot of things we're talking about follows. It's just that there is a requirement for an institutional change or institutional attention to these issues from a, from a perspective of a person who's going through it and not just from a person like perspective from a you know from a, an overarching god sort of perspective you need to be the experience worker ant yes that's the, that's a very important thing after so at, at the last um, mental health awareness week i gave a talk and there was also a streamed online and after that, um, a friend back from Cologne, where I was doing my bachelor's studies, contacted me um, and said, hey, I've, I've seen this talk. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that she was uh, struggling with mental health issues. She already did when we were back in the bachelor's. So this was a, like already, I don't know, six, seven years ago or something like that. And she said to me, this is the first time I feel like somebody other, somebody understands what I'm what I'm getting through, yeah. and she tried like three, four, five different therapies, mm -hmm. and she always felt like they have no fucking clue what she's talking about. They really just don't have an idea. They have their yeah. their protocol and they have their diagnosis and they have their medicines, but they they don't listen. And just having somebody um, ex talking about their own experience and just making this very plastic. Um, helped her so much not feeling alone, just not feeling alone anymore. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was a point where I thought, wow, we really need to do something here. Because, I mean, I'm a chemist by training. I should not be the one giving the mental health talks. <laughs> Yet nobody exactly. else does. So yeah. in a desperate attempt, I started and the reception is just tremendous. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I see this hole that needs really needs to be filled. This space that is there for for the idea which we now call the collective. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I definitely think that this institutional change that Serena mentioned is it's really important that yes. we actually are becoming more aware of these things and also find, as you said, like some like uh, have like someone to take in all these people and like share their experiences, right? To basically gather and say, okay, we. Like everyone's having like problems with this. Like this is like not something that is just in one institute, one person, mm -hmm. but rather this is generally a topic, and we need to address it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I'm really hoping that uh, from now on, the Max Planck Society will put more effort in this because so I mean, do we. It, so like, do we. Like a <laughs> bottom-up approach will only go so far if yeah. the top people will not, uh, if they don't want this to be a thing, they will not let it be a thing. Well. 
So I, I, we don't really give them the, the choice to decide. We will continue. Yeah, we are real really stubborn, yes. as you might have noticed. And I mean, <laughs> this answer good. now connects to your question from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Like, if it's a problem to share your personal story, I mean, it's not because you know you're helping someone, and mm -hmm. like just like <clears throat> describing someone how alone you felt or how bad you actually felt, and someone recognizing themselves into this is incredibly comforting. Mm -hmm. And it's way more comforting than any doctor or therapist can tell you because if you hear this from your peer and you feel that you are feeling the same thing, it's mm -hmm. it's it's really. I mean, it sounds super simple, but it it's truly life changing. I mean, mm -hmm. they went through the same thing, right? They know what it's like. Your therapist you works nine it. to five. Yeah, you, you really you feel, feel this. If, if the person knows what they are talking mm -hmm. about, or if they just read yes. about it. Yeah. 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 Like it makes a difference. And I think this is one of the reasons why it's really hard to find a therapist that fits you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you can easily feel just you're talking to a wall and you get yeah. no real feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to, uh, yeah, so to quote, uh, you know, like we all say, we hope for the best things and we hope that these things happen. So, you know, to quote Andy Dufresne from Shawshank Redemption, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things and no good thing ever dies so i think with that we'd like to end this episode of the recording thanks guys thanks a lot for thanks joining us for thank episode. you it's really awesome to thank talk you for to you holding this space for us thank, thank you. you for having us here and for your support yeah and we will hopefully hear from each other in the future certainly certainly yes love and light okay I think that was an interesting discussion with uh, JD and Barbara and to hear their stories and uh, the yeah. kinds of numbers that we see in academia, it's quite appalling, isn't it? Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, um, it was really nice of them to share, to be so honest, uh, first of all, and open about these things. Um, and yeah, as they mentioned a lot, uh, just giving, bringing awareness to the topic, I think, is uh, the biggest uh, thing we need, or the first hurdle to tackle now before we can do a lot of other things, right? Definitely. Ali? I mean... So, I mean, the numbers, I guess, we're talking about are specifically within the pre of a Max Planck Institute, right? As well, like from the survey, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, coming coming to do my PhD here, like from another country, I do, I do think that there's, there's a lot of differences, mm. you know, moving to another place and doing a PhD versus I did my master's degree in my hometown. Like, you have a lot of other pressures that you don't have. Like I came here not knowing anyone and then you know everyone you work with. And so sometimes it makes it feel like you can never really get a break from your science. Also the language, right? Yeah, exactly. Like there's a real, depending on what part of Germany you're in, there can be a real language barrier. And then, you know, it's, it's almost like an always on culture when you're always hanging out with your colleagues. like. It's great and you have other interests, but the work, the conversation can always come back to work and it can, I, I think, really make you feel a bit always on. Work is always there. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how that is reflected maybe specifically within the Max Planck Institute, which is very international compared with other university organizations. Yeah, I totally agree. And I also see that there is like a huge need for a shift in terms of perspective towards all of these issues that we face especially in terms of mental health and you know like if one is really going through these things the signs may not be as telltale as sometimes people think about it and it may not be as simple as JD already mentioned it's just a question of where your water level is are you below a certain level or do you feel above a certain level on a daily basis and I think this is gonna, I mean, if every one of us is able to try to set our own levels and try to judge it some way or the other, I think it's already a step in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, generally, one thing, as you mentioned, is just uh, assessing the situation again, right? And with the Max, uh, the PhD net surveys, uh, if they're conducted every year now, then you see what the the people think and it seems actually I think as far as I remember from this year's survey um, the numbers again were rather high and one thing that I think I remember quite clearly was 60% of people have like anxiety issues which mm -hmm. is 
insane. I mean, that's more than that's close to two thirds. And so I really hope that the measures that are being taken at the moment will drive this number down because uh, this is, I mean, we can't have like yeah. two thirds of PhD students suffering from anxiety. Um, yeah. This, yeah, it's just and not have right. a healthy, you know, in terms of and have a healthy uh, society in terms of uh, mental health as well as physical health. But anyway, well, I mean, I think I think somehow there needs to be a broader culture shift in in science. Like I, I'm really grateful coming into the PhD. My my dad did his PhD. I mean, decades ago now, but he gave me some really like good advice that is helpful to me when I'm feeling very anxious because it's true. Like you worry about, I need to do this experiment. I need to get a good postdoc. If I'm going to be a PI, not many people can't become PIs and you feel this kind of constant anxiety. But the advice my dad gave me when I was starting my PhD was like, it's hard. So you need to love it. Why are you doing a PhD? If it's just for a job at the end, you're going to like, basically you're going to have a hard time. And so whenever like, the anxiety gets to me I really try to think about the things I love about science getting in like go in and do something that like piques my curiosity and like discovering something new and I I think that sometimes there needs to be a shift towards really rewarding mm -hmm. curiosity rather than just yeah. the paper the data <laughs> yeah completely agree with that yeah so let's hope that in the future like the people in power will realize that the science doesn't just uh, get it doesn't get done within like a month uh, but rather it's curiosity as you mentioned Ali uh, that also, drives it forward. Also the humans behind the science are important exactly. not just the science itself. Anyway I think with that we've come to a nice conclusion to this very long episode and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it and I hope you guys are keeping track of the Mental Health Awareness Week initiatives being done by the amazing collective and uh, let's talk about this more as much as we can so that we can be aware of what the issues are as well as try to bring these issues to light anyway with that i want to say goodbye to all of you and i think it's a bye from nico bye and a bye from ali until next time all right bye bye Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Clank PhD Net and the Science Communication Working Group known as the Offspring Magazine. The series is hosted by Srinath Ramkumar, Nikolai Horman, and Alison Lewis, and will soon also be hosted by Adrian Ahoya and Sandra Fendel. If you'd like to write to us with any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. The intro outro music is composed by Srinath Ramkumar, and the pre intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. And I'll see you all next week. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy. And also, please be aware of your mental health. It's very important. And follow the updates of the Mental Health Awareness Week. See you all next week. Bye.